good please to welcome you for this third uh, in our series of uh, lectures this quarter on um, in the Bible and its interpreters uh, series sponsored by the uh, Levy uh, Center for Jewish Studies at UCLA and also the Department of Surrounding and Culture. Um, just a, like a hint of what's going to come on next year, we are planning a joint um, uh, sponsored uh, conference on uh, the Persian context, uh, the Roman context of the, of the Bible. Um, so we'll have a major three-day conference um, next year with the Port of Hood Center for the Study of Ancient Around the World. It should be really cool next year, so keep an eye on that. In order for you to keep an eye on that, what you really should do is go to the back and sign up for the email list. Uh, about all the event, events for the Center for Jewish Studies. This is a fantastic um, set of events that we have ongoing all the time in the uh, Lady Center uh, um, uh, at UCLA. So today I am really, really pleased to be able to introduce um, Dr. Daniel um, Shayla, who is a, a PhD from Notre Dame University and currently a, a professor and chair of the Department of Religious Studies at McMaster University in Ontario. Um, his research focuses on ancient interpretation in the Hebrew Bible and Second Temple Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as especially Aramaic texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's written a lot of articles, uh, including an article in the Journal of Jewish Studies um, on rewritten scripture, an article in the Journal for Biblical Literature on um, Tobit and Genesis Apocryphon, an article in Catholic Biblical Quarterly on um, the Lord or God, Tobit and the Tetragrammaton, um, and an uh, important article in the um, Dead Sea. Um, uh, um, um, the Dead Sea Studies um, series on Qumran Pesharim as biblical commentaries, as well as a, um, an edition of the Dead Sea Scrolls Aramaic uh, Genesis Apocryphon. And um, he's going to touch today a little bit on his new research, which in his talk entitled From Enoch to Daniel Reimagining the Past in the Aramaic Dead Sea Scrolls. Please join me in welcoming um, Professor Bashir. Thank you very much, Professor Shadowin, uh, Professor Bonashow as well, for the invitation. I just want to thank uh, Nelk and the Center for Jewish Studies for having me here to share some of my research. It's very exciting for me. I've never been to LA, UCLA before, and coming from Canada, one expects it to be nice, but maybe not quite this nice. So it's going to be a little hard to leave, I think, after uh, coming here, but it really is uh, such a pleasure to be here, and I'm so excited to talk a little bit about my research and hopefully talk together a little bit about it uh, after that. Um, so this talk will be on the Aramaic Dead Sea Scrolls and some of my uh, most recent thoughts on those scrolls. So I'll just jump right into it. Many, many lectures have been given on the Dead Sea Scrolls over the seven decades since their sensational introduction to the world in the late 1940s. These lectures often cover topics like the scrolls in the Bible, the scrolls in the Jewish sect, probably Essene or related to the Essenes, responsible for what is often called the sectarian writings, the scrolls in early Christianity, or increasingly the scrolls in rabbinic Judaism. It is not a stretch to say that the incredible discovery fundamentally reshaped entire fields of research on the Bible and ancient Judaism, such as our starting points and assumptions for doing textual criticism, or the early developmental stages of halakha. Far fewer lectures have addressed a collection of roughly 30 early Jewish literary works composed in Aramaic, and it is on these texts that I will focus in my talk today. Aside from introducing you to this creative slice of literature from the Second Temple period, my goal is to advance a working hypothesis about these texts, which is as follows. The majority of the Aramaic writings kept at Qumran approximately 20 out of the 30 compositions, represents the creative genius of a distinctive circle of authors, active from as early as the late Persian period to the end of the Hellenistic period, around the time that the Hasmoneans came to power in the mid-2nd century BCE. 
This literature was written for a wide Jewish audience with the basic goals of instilling hope in listeners and offering patterns for living a life of virtue and fidelity to the Most High God in the face of the ascendant, pervasive, and by all appearances victorious Persian and Hellenistic empires. I will begin by giving a brief overview of the Aramaic scrolls with a view to this working hypothesis. I will then turn to some examples of how these texts reimagine and reshape ancestral traditions that we now call biblical. So first, a little bit about the Aramaic literature from Qumran. Now, I've got a number of slides that I'm going to be uh, cycling through up on the screen here. Um, it really just kind of augments what I'm saying. So often I'll be putting texts and such up on the screen just to kind of illustrate some of the points that I'm making. So you can just sort of look at those if you like uh, as, I, as I talk. So approximately 130 of the more than 900 manuscripts found in the Qumran caves are written in Aramaic, comprising roughly 15% of the entire scroll's corpus. Not only are many of our individual manuscripts very fragmentary, but the same can be said for the corpus as a whole. As for what we do possess, the works traditionally gathered under the, under the rubric of First or Ethiopic Enoch is best attested with 11 copies, followed by another text related to the figure of Enoch, the so-called Book of Giants, at 10 copies. Next comes the Aramaic portions of Daniel, which we know from the Hebrew Bible, and then a text of which I will speak in a little while, the Aramaic Levi document. A number of interesting texts were found not only uh, with excuse me, were found only in one or two copies, such as a first-person prayer placed in the mouth of the Babylonian king, Nabonidus, and the Genesis Apocryphon, which creatively re rewrites parts of Genesis in Aramaic. We'll come back to that text later on as well. So, the Aramaic scrolls from Qumran comprise a substantial portion of the wider Qumran corpus and are distributed across the caves in which manuscripts were found. But is there any reason to consider these texts as a group, aside from their language and composition alone? As I, have, as I have already suggested, for a considerable number of the Aramaic scrolls, the answer, or at least my answer to that question, is yes. We can see the affinity among these texts in at least four areas. First, their basic literary approach. Second, a shared set of themes and interests. Third, their common use of characteristic idioms, and fourth, their Aramaic dialect. Over the next few minutes, I will look briefly at the first three of these areas. So of the roughly 30 Aramaic, Aramaic works found in Qumran, well over half are written as entertaining narratives told in large part from the first-person perspectives of either men and women linked with Israel's past, here are some examples up there for you, or, in a few cases, by associated angelic or quasi-angelic beings. All of the examples on the slide here are attributed to venerable humans from Israel's past, but we also find the remarkable first-person address of the angel Michael to his fellow angels in a text called The Words of Michael. And in the Book of Giants, we are privy to the first-person debates, discussions, and visions of the monstrous children of the Watchers and human women, spoken of in Genesis 6. Although our knowledge of the narrative scope of most of these texts is incomplete because they're fragmentary, it is clear that their first-person accounts were regularly set within sparse third-person frameworks, often little more than an introductory formula. And I've given you some examples of this in the red up on the screen. You can also see some of the first-person narrative on some of these quotes as well. It is notable that, the, that historical autobiographical narratives of this sort found in the Aramaic texts from Qumran are not very common in the Hebrew Bible or other Second Temple literature, uh, Jewish literature from the Second Temple period. In the Hebrew Bible, we have Deuteronomy, parts of Ezra and Nehemiah, and of course Daniel that use this narrative approach. In the prophetic literature, we also find first-person accounts, especially of oracles or visions, as in Isaiah 6. But narrative sections tend to be told in the third-person voice. This is the case, for example, in most narrative portions of Jeremiah. And here are just a couple of other examples of what I'm talking about following on the previous slide. At the same time, there is a very strong literary resemblance between the Qumran Aramaic texts and international Aramaic literature of the Persian period, such as the tale of Ahikar and the Aramaic translation of Darius the Great's autobiographical retrospective, 
best known from the Behistun inscription. And just for comparison, I've given you those two up here to look at. Both of these texts were found in the Jewish military camp on the island of Elephantine in southern Egypt. Another broad aspect of this literature is its apparently selective historical scope. Devorah de Mont was the first to observe that the extant texts fall quite naturally into two groups, one clustered around the period of the ancestors of Genesis and Exodus, and the other around Israel's successive exiles to Assyria, Babylonia, and Persia. Both de Mont and Jonathan Ben Dove have suggested a coordination between the fictional settings of these texts and the author's choice of Aramaic language, since in their view, both the distant ancestors and the exiles might have been expected to speak Aramaic. The fact that the books were written in Aramaic would, then, be part of a literary fiction related to their purported historical settings. In my opinion, the author's choice of historical periods for their fictional or quasi-fictional accounts is better explained in light of the time during which they were composed and their intended audience or audiences. By writing about the periods of the distant ancestors and the exiles, the authors could address indirectly the conditions of living without political independence under the rule and cultural norms of foreign nations. These were early, earlier eras, eras that could easily be applied to the Hellenistic period setting in which these texts were composed, and as such, they could speak to the pressing needs of the authors and their audiences. This also helps to explain why the Aramaic literature seems to fade out quite abruptly during the second century BCE, since it is precisely when the Hasmoneans gain national independence and institute sweeping cultural changes across Jewish society, at least in the land of Israel. These changes evidently included a shift of writing national literature in Hebrew rather than Aramaic, though the appeal of at least some of the Aramaic writings appear to have endured. We see this, for example, in the Hebrew Book of Jubilees, where some of the Aramaic traditions were adjusted and placed in a new literary frame centered much more clearly on Moses and Sinai. The Aramaic tales of Daniel in chapters 2 to 7 were augmented with the Hebrew chapters, and uh, Tobit was translated into Hebrew, so far as we can tell. A small set of set genre pieces is also shared among a surprising number of the Aramaic Qumran texts. Most widespread is the dream vision, an area now studied comprehensively by Andrew Perrin, who has shown that the stock motifs and idioms are creatively deployed in apocalyptic visions re received by Enoch, Noah, Levi, and Daniel, to name just a few. There are many more. Um, also very popular were stories of intrigue in foreign royal courts involving Israelites. We know such court tales passed from the book of Daniel, but now also have several new ones, including the so-called pseudo-Daniel texts, Jews in the Persian court, the Four Kingdoms, and the Prayer of Nabonidus. The first chapter of Tobit contains a condensed court story that incorporates the Mesopotamian Achikar account, itself a court tale of similar genre to those already mentioned, and in the Genesis Apocryphon, the story of Sarai and Abram in Egypt from Genesis 12 has been deftly shaped more clearly into a court tale. Talk about that a little bit more later on. Finally, we find a repeated focus on ancestral wisdom teaching being passed from fathers to their children, a setting that would later develop into the testament genre, exemplified by the Greek testaments of the twelve patriarchs. Many of the Aramaic texts include first person didactic wisdom speeches, good examples being found in the Epistle of Enoch, the end of the Aramaic Levi document, the testament of Kahat, and parts of Tobit. Uh, we find in these discourses a set of repeating themes such as living a life of righteousness and wisdom and fidelity to ancestral customs like proper marriage. And here you see a few examples of some of the texts. So this leads us naturally to some distinctive themes shared among the Aramaic scrolls that are not prominent, for example, in most books of the Hebrew Bible or the sectarian literature from Qumran. A strong focus on the Levitical priesthood is clearly present in the Aramaic Levi document and the visions of Amram, which is another text among these Aramaic scrolls. But the elevated roles of priests are also addressed in many other places. Enoch, Noah, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob are all turned into proto-priests in this literature. 
who observed the details of priestly legislation given to Moses on Sinai well before that event happened. The message here is that the revelation of Sinai was simply the codification of practices already followed and taught for generations by elect individuals, starting with Enoch. In a basic way, this is comparable to what Philo would later do with the, these early biblical figures, though Philo applies a much more overtly Hellenistic notion of virtue in his representation of the ancestors. Another widespread theme is proper marriage. Noah, Isaac, Kahat, Amram, Levi, and Tobit address explicitly, and at some length, either their own marriages or the necessity of proper marriage in general. Although less overt than in the cases just cited, a critique of improper marriage is also in view in the Enochic Book of Watchers, the Animal Apocalypse, and the Book of Giants, which focus on the disastrous results of the improper marriages between angelic watchers and human women, based on the enigmatic events recorded in Genesis 6, verses 1 to 7. A final example of a shared theme in the Aramaic literature is closely related to the ancestral wisdom discourses already mentioned, the dualistic bifurcation of conduct into two starkly opposed categories represented by two paths. And you can see some examples of the text up here. Uh, the underlying uh, phrases are the activity that's taking place, the walking in and such, or the straying from, and the, the red highlighting is talking about the paths themselves. Uh, in my opinion, this is a fresh adaptation of two paths imagery drawn from the book of Psalms and especially Proverbs, now retrofitted to Israel's ancestors, in a way akin to the retrojection of priestly regulations to the likes of Noah and Isaac. Here we find a central wisdom theme applied to prominent figures from Israel's past. I draw this first part of my talk to a close with a quick look at some specific idioms, phrases, and words which speak to a shared idiomat idiomatic and semantic lexicon for those who wrote much of our Aramaic literature. And now I'm going to break from my script for a minute and just show you some slides and, and walk quickly through them to show you some of these more isolated phrases that, to my mind, speak to uh, some kind of shared compositional background uh, among a number of these texts. So, uh, just a couple of slides I'll lead you through. The first here um, is the box up on the right. You see, uh, here are several Aramaic phrases, which I've also translated into English for you, um, from on the top, a text called The Visions of Amram. Um, Amram is the father of Moses, um, Aaron, and Miriam in the Bible. Uh, this, the next one down is from uh, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, Levi, the Aramaic Levi document, and the bottom one is from the Genesis Apocryphon, which I've already mentioned. And you can see that all of these phrases are uh, um, phrases which talk about waking up uh, from a dream episode that they've had. And you just see isolated phrases like this, and you might say, well, I mean, how many ways did they have of speaking about waking up? Uh, even in English today, we, we only use a few phrases maybe for waking up. But what's important here is not only the phrases themselves, but the context, the literary context in which we find them. So all, in all three of these different texts, it's virtually the same sort of scenario. So a dream vision uh, has just been had by whoever's speaking in this text. And uh, some divine revelation has been given to them. And immediately upon the, the completion of that dream vision, they say the same phrase. Three different people, three different texts. So we've got something more going on here, I think. Something very similar here. Uh, a couple of different texts. The text on the top, 4Q546. Uh, for those who, who aren't familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is the way that the scrolls are referred to. Uh, the four is the cave. Q means Qumran, the place where they were found. And then 546 in the top uh, example there is the catalog number for that particular manuscript. This again is the visions of Amram that I talked about, Moses uh, and Aaron and Miriam's father. And then the text on the bottom is a text called the Four Kingdoms, which is a fragmentary text which is mostly just a vision uh, in which someone is being shown four different successive kingdoms, much like we find in the book of Daniel and Daniel 7 or some other places. Again, very similar phrases in a very similar situation within a dream vision, where the person seeing the vision is asking a question to someone in the vision or an object in the vision. In the bottom case, it's a tree. There's a tree that moves around and talks in this vision. And so the seer, we don't know who the seer is in this vision, is asking the tree something. 
In the top, uh, there are two angels who are interrogating Amram. Uh, and and uh, he asks them a question, but they use the same kind of formulaic introduction to their questions within the dream vision. So again, similar phrase, but also in a very similar context. Last one on the bottom, um, this is from the Genesis Apocryphon, and another text which I mentioned earlier, the Book of Giants, which is related to uh, the Book of Enoch. And in both of these cases, somebody in the text is going to speak with Enoch. So it's the very same sort of thing going on in both texts, different texts. Um, and in both cases, they say that they're going to Enoch to, and then he, we get these phrases, to find out everything from him in certainty that uh, they might know. It's a very similar phrase in the Book of Giants to what we find in the Genesis Apocrypha. So you get this repeated over and over again. And I think I'll just skip quickly through this slide. I won't talk to you uh, in depth through these examples. But here are other examples very similar to those where we find phrases that are mirrored in two different texts in very similar settings. So these start to pile up eventually, and one starts to wonder, hmm, what's going on here? And this is what kind of led me to this idea of uh, stereo compositional background for these texts. OK, so to sum up thus far, I have presented a web of literary interconnections found among a large segment of the Aramaic writings discovered at Qumran. These connections occur at different compositional levels, from large-scale literary decisions to the use of isolated idioms and words. Not only do these connections serve to relate texts like the Genesis Apocryphon, Daniel, the Book of Giants, and Tobit to one another in varying patterns of association, but at the same time they distance this group from most books of the Hebrew Bible on the one hand, and most Jewish literature from the Second Temple period on the other. When we add to these literary affinities the fact that our texts were written in a fairly uniform dialect of late official Aramaic, which consistently exhibits the features of a Jewish idiolect, the most plausible conclusion is that these texts emerged from an organized circle of Jewish authors, probably during the 4th to 2nd centuries BCE. So, now I'll move to the second section of my paper. In the second part of my paper, we will look at a few examples of how Aramaic texts from Qumran imaginatively reworked aspects of Israel's ancestral Hebrew writings, which include what we nowadays would call the Hebrew Bible. In the, in the context of my paper, these examples are intended to illustrate in greater detail some of the literary features and themes already discussed, and to give a better sense of how traditions were reshaped to address concerns relevant to the text's authors and, presumably, their audiences. Let us begin with the Genesis Apocryphon, the paradigmatic example of what many have called rewritten Bible or rewritten scripture among the Qumran Aramaic texts. The scroll's 23 columns retell the story of Genesis from the genealogies of chapter 5 to the covenant account of chapter 15, although both ends of the scroll are missing and many parts of it are fragmentary. Especially in the earlier parts of the scroll, there are a number of major additions or alterations to Genesis such as the story of Lamech and his wife Batenosh arguing over Noah's alarming appearance at birth. Uh, Noah is born, and we're told there that he, he stands up immediately after birth, uh, opens his eyes, and his eyes shine like uh, flashlights, and he can speak immediately and starts praising God. So this, this uh, is an alarming experience for them. So we get the story told in the Genesis Apocryphon. Uh, this purports his amazing future, of course, in the scroll. So, and as many commentators have noted, the narrative draws much closer to the basic outline of Genesis in the scroll's last preserved sections. There are a lot more additions in the earlier part having to do with Enoch and Noah. Once we get to the Abram story, it starts to snap into line more closely with what we know of uh, the biblical text of Genesis. So I'll examine two episodes in the Apocryphon interrupted by a look at the Aramaic Levi document. Both episodes are placed shortly after Noah and his family leave the ark following the great flood of Genesis 7 to 8, retold in Genesis Apocryphon columns 7 to 10. The first event is Noah's sacrifice, which he offers immediately after disembarking. As you can see on the slide up here, this passage, the passage is characteristically brief in Genesis 8 verses 20 to 22, stating simply that Noah sacrificed burnt offerings from clean animals and birds using the general Hebrew noun for a sacrifice, olah or here in the plural, olot. This is in keeping with the sacrifices of the patriarchs in Genesis more generally, which are extemporaneous and nonspecific in terms of their cultic valence. 
Judging simply by context, most interpreters have guessed that Noah's sacrifice in Genesis was given in thanksgiving for having, having been saved from the devastating flood, as Philo believed, or, as Josephus thought, to petition the Lord not to send another such flood in the future. It is only beginning with the covenant code in Exodus, and especially the priestly instructions of Leviticus, that we find a typology laid out for sacrifice on different occasions, with different effects. That is to say, in the Pentateuch, the specifics of Israelite priestly sacrifice appear with the revelation given to Moses at Sinai. When we turn to the Genesis Apocryphon, I'll give you the text up here. You'll have a little while to look at it, so don't worry, I won't change it very soon. We find an account significantly expanded from that in Genesis, containing much more cultic detail. Perhaps the most striking difference is that Noah's sacrifice has been turned into a purification offering, a chatat, thus having to do with the rite of atonement. This is seen in two added details not found in Genesis. First, Noah uses the verb kafar to atone in his description of the sacrifice. It's pretty obvious that that's what he's meaning then. And second, he pours out the blood of the sacrifice at the base of the altar rather than dashing it against the altar's sides. Now, pouring blood at the altar's base is repeatedly associated with the chatat sacrifice in the Pentateuch, for example, in Exodus 29 or Leviticus 4 to 5, while dashing blood against the sides of the altar is the more standard practice used in the case of daily burnt offerings, peace offerings, and guilt offerings, and so forth. So the choice of a chatat for Noah's sacrifice signals that the offering was meant to cleanse the earth from impurity, thus treating residual sin on earth from the events that led to the flood in a way that resembles the eventual management of sin at the tabernacle and later the temple. What is more, in contrast to the simple telling of Genesis, the Apocryphon has Noah follow a rigorous sacrificial order that includes three distinct stages and several substances not mentioned in Genesis. Noah begins by placing the head and then the fat of a now lost animal on the altar likely a goat, reckoning from the stipulations of Numbers 15, and a parallel in the later book of Jubilees, chapter 6. This is followed by a second stage dealing with the animal's blood and the flesh, and then a third stage that included sacrificing birds, fine flour, oil, incense, and wine. As an addendum, Noah says that he sprinkled salt over everything. The birds are likely included because they are mentioned in Genesis 8, verse 20, but the flour, oil, incense, wine, and salt are entirely new. Why are they added here? The answer seems to be that whoever composed the Apocryphon considered a proper, complete sacrifice to include all of these elements, based on the exegetical combination of various passages from, <coughs> excuse me, from the Pentateuch. In Numbers 15, verses 20 to 24, one can plausibly infer that the chatat is prescribed, here I quote, with its grain offering and drink offering, according to the custom, kamishpat. Though neither of these items is mentioned in the earlier legislation of Exodus 29 or Leviticus 4 to 5. In Mishnah Horayot 2, 6, the differences between these two passages are resolved by claiming that Leviticus lays down the general rule, that is, you don't need these things, while well, Numbers 15 is a special case, case applied only in the event of idolatry. So if it's idolatry, you do need these extra things. The Genesis Apocryphon and other Second Temple sources seem instead to have taken the grain and drink offerings of Numbers 15 to stand as the general principle that also applied to other less specific passages in the Pentateuch. Something similar has happened with the statement about strewing salt on all of your offerings in Leviticus 2 verse 13. Halakhic sources comparable to the Apocryphon on these points are the Temple Scroll from Qumran Cave 11 and Jubilees. The upshot of these expansions is that the Genesis Apocryphon now shows Noah carefully doing his sacrifice by the book, though many generations before the book existed. As mentioned earlier, a number of the Aramaic texts at Qumran betray a concern to show the antiquity and divine election of the Levitical priesthood, and this seems to be precisely what is happening here. Aaron and those in his line were, in fact, maintaining a cultic tradition that was already ancient when the regulations were conveyed to Moses at Sinai. Turning now to the Aramaic Levite document, we find a passage that, in my opinion, is closely related to the one just examined in the Apocryphon. 
Aramaic Levi is often classified as a parabiblical text or a proto-testament, vastly expanding on the little information given about Levi in Genesis and elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, using literary building blocks similar to the Genesis Apocrypha. One such block is a long discourse on proper cultic sacrifice placed in the mouth of Levi's grandfather Isaac. Though Isaac tells Levi he received the teaching from Abraham, at least part of which was transmitted to him in a book concerning the blood, written down by none other than Noah. In Greenfield Stone and Eschel's edition of the text, chapter 8 deals, details the way in which to make a burnt offering, beginning in 8 verse 1 with the fact that the blood of the animal sacrifice is to be dashed against the sides of the altar. Almost all interpreters have understood Isaac to be speaking of the occasional burnt offering outlined in Leviticus 1. But in a recent article, Hillel Mali has argued convincingly that this is more likely the daily morning tamid offering discussed in Exodus 29 and Numbers 28. As Mali shows, the orders of the washing practices in chapter 7 and the sacrifice itself in chapter 8 are carefully constructed pastiches of cultic passages from the Pentateuch reinforced by Isaac's st summative statement that all Levi's cultic activities should be done in order, be seraph in Aramaic. Previous discussions of this passage typically have overlooked some striking similarities to Noah's sacrifice in the Genesis Apocrypha. And here I've given you a slide which looks sort of confusing at first, so let me just explain it a little bit. Um, on the top, uh, the main text there, we have Genesis Apocrypha. Underneath, we have the passage from the Aramaic Levi document. And up on the top is kind of a key, so I color-coded the corresponding parts of the sacrifice in these two texts. So the, stage one, the first part, is in the yellowish color, uh, stage two in the red, and stage three in the blue. So I'll talk about these just a little bit right now. So both texts have a first discrete stage of the sacrifice focused on the animal's head and fat, probably drawn from the wording of Leviticus 1 verse 8. After mentioning the head, both accounts signal the primacy of this part of the sacrifice with the temporal phrase, at first, lekadmin, which incidentally does not have a parallel in Leviticus 1 verse 8 or similar passages. So it shows up here, but not in the biblical exemplars. Each text signals clearly the end of this first stage, the Genesis Apocrypha with the word second, to Nina, and Aramaic Levi with the conjunction after it, Uftarohi, which in each case begins a description of the remainder of the animal. Matching lists of fine flour mixed with oil, incense, and wine constitute the third stage of the sacrifices. Both accounts mention the sprinkling of salt over the sacrifices and conclude with statements about their pleasing aromas. What are we to make of these similarities? Well, to begin, we might wonder about a shared compositional background, as I have already suggested. In terms of their message, however, both passages are making similar moves. For one thing, the reader or listener is learning the proper ways in which a sacrifice is to be done, what we might call the halakhic content of these passages. At the same time, Aramaic Levi, like the Apocryphon, is claiming that priestly practices formalized at Sinai were already known and practiced long before that time by select individuals like Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Levi. Like Noah, Isaac and Levi assiduously and preemptively followed Pentateuchal priestly practice. This message would have had special urgency during the Hellenistic period when Jews were facing enormous external uncertainties with the collapse of the relatively stable Persian Empire and the wars fought between Alexander's successors. Amidst this uncertainty, the priesthood was being portrayed as a point of permanence, the keeper and teacher of a divinely revealed wisdom that stretched all the way back to Enoch. Our second passage from the Genesis Apocrypha can be dealt with more briefly. It follows closely on the sacrifice just discussed, creatively reworking the enigmatic events at the end of Genesis 9 and the so-called Table of Nations in Genesis 10. The last verses of Genesis 9 have proven to be a crux for interpreters through the centuries, recording an episode in which Noah plants a vineyard and drinks its wine, gets drunk, and lays down uncovered inside his tent. Noah's son Ham sees his father's nakedness, tells his two brothers, Shem and Japheth, outside, who proceed to place a garment on their shoulders and walk discreetly backwards into the tent to cover Noah. When Noah awakes and realizes what happened, 
He surprisingly curses not Ham, as we might expect, but Ham's son Canaan. This is followed in Genesis 10 by a genealogical listing of Noah's three sons and their descendants, supplemented with various ethnographic and geographic details. Okay. Uh, so from antiquity until today, the story in Genesis 9 has typically been understood to reflect negatively on Noah. And one goal of the Genesis Apocryphon's rewriting was to make very clear that Noah, who is a paragon of wisdom and righteousness in the scroll, did nothing wrong. This is accomplished in part by reading the Hebrew word vayitgal. You can see the Hebrew vayitgal betoch ahohalo up here. The vayitgal uh, highlighted there in red. Uh, typically understood as, and he was uncovered, referring to Noah. Instead, the scroll reads this instead as meaning, and it was uncovered, or it was revealed, referring now to the contents of an otherwise unknown dream vision, not mentioned in Genesis. So, rather than Noah being uncovered, the author takes advantage of there being no stated subject of the verb and assumes that it was a dream vision revealed or uncovered inside his tent. Genesis Apocryphon columns 12 to 17 are very fragmentary, but enough text is preserved to discern the basic outline of Noah's dream and its outcome. In the dream, Noah is represented symbolically as a cedar tree, from which three main boughs, his three sons, spring forth. Smaller branches and twigs emerge from these larger boughs, representing successive generations of descendants, just like a family tree, right? We have the boughs and then there are different uh, family groups branching off. And the dream evidently reveals the activities of these tree parts, which can move around on their own. In this way, so this is kind of like an animated, think Harry Potter or something, uh, you know, an animated uh, picture or something, things are happening in this picture of this tree. In this way, Noah is informed symbolically through the movements of the trees, boughs, branches, and shoots about the future conduct of his sons and their descendants. This somewhat forced interpretive move ingeniously explains why Noah woke from his sleep and cursed Canaan. In the dream, the area occupied by the branches and shoots of each bough represents an earthly allotment of territory. And the dream predicts the offshoot of one bough's one bough branching into an area occupied by another offshoot. We are missing most of the dream's interpretation, but it is fairly clear that this action symbolically represented Canaan's appropriation of an area that rightly belonged to Shem's son, Arpachshad, the lineal ancestor of Israel. So one of the branches of Ham is moving into the area of one of the branches of Shem, which it shouldn't be doing in the dream, on this tree. And Noah sees this and has it explained to him in, in the dream. As in Jubilees, the Apocryphon adopts the view that this part of the eastern Mediterranean basin was originally given with divine sanction to Arpachshad during Noah's lifetime, but was then illegally seized by Canaan, setting the background in the Abram story in Genesis 11. All of this is confirmed in columns 16 to 17 of the scroll, which completely reshapes Genesis 10 into a much more orderly account. In this rewriting of Genesis, Noah allots all of uh, Africa to Ham, the Levant in Asia Minor to Shem, and Europe to, to Japheth. At the same time, the author adapted the less organized biblical account into a neat three-part Hellenistic conception of the earth known from Greek writers like Agathemerus and Dionysius Periagetes. So uh, basically a, a Hellenistic conception of the world and a Hellenistic kind of uh, conceptual map is being used by the scroll here to talk about these different allotments in the scroll. And I've given you up on the screen um, a, a map which is meant to kind of reflect uh, the allotments in the Genesis Apocryphon and also in Jubilees. And here's a reconstruction of Dionysius's map, um, which to be, I guess, uh, exactly comparable to what I have up there on the right side of the screen would be, need to be turned 90 degrees to the left uh, with the Mediterranean Sea on the bottom. But the conception of the world is very similar in, in these, uh, these, these two places. Okay, so in terms of biblical interpretation, this reworking of Genesis 9 to 10, which hinges on the resignification of the word Vayit Gal, exonerates Noah of potential bad judgment, explains his curse of Canaan, and provides an explanatory backstory to the eventual conquest of Canaan. 
Placed within the broader scope of the Aramaic literature of Qumran, we also get a sense of the messages this story must have carried for its Hellenistic period audience. At a time without political self-autonomy or ultimate control over their ancestral homeland, readers and listeners were assured that their claim on the land had a most ancient authoritative pedigree. It may be governed by others at present, but the highest court of appeal for any claim to the land would most assuredly render judgment in the favor of Israel. What is more, Noah's vision demonstrates that human events are known and advanced by God and are carefully governed by him. This accords with the basic message of many other apocalyptic visions within an, with an eschatological horizon, as in the Enochic and Danielic literature. Things may look bad at present, but there is a much longer game at play with a predetermined end that favors the people of God. So I'll end my limited survey by turning briefly to the Book of Tobit, a composition found in at least four copies among the Qumran texts, alongside one copy of the Hebrew translation that attests to the book's enduring appeal. Irene Noel summarized the view of many interpreters when she wrote that a major characteristic of this book is the allusion to earlier biblical texts. Indeed, Tobit is a rich, complex, complex literary creation that draws on earlier ancestral writings like Job, Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Proverbs to form a new story set in the period of the Assyrian exile, and thus addressing particularly exilic concerns. Here I will focus on just two examples of Tobit's imaginative reuse of the Genesis story, which nicely illustrate the use of existing authoritative texts to create literature for a new audience. The book's two major plot lines involve Tobit, residing in Nineveh, and his relative Sarah, who lives in the city of Ekbatana in Media. Each protagonist suffers a tremendous trial, and the two tragic plots come together through the figure of Tobit's son, Tobiah, who is guided on an eventful journey from Nineveh to Ekbatana by the disguised angel Raphael, whose human name is Azariah, uh, well, he's incognito. Spinovic first documented that while describing the journey, the author of Tobit reused a distinctive phrase from the story of the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22, often called the Akedah, or Akedat Yitzchak. And so I'll show you that in just a moment here. Um, Yes, yeah, I want that one up there. So along Isaac's momentous journey to Moriah with Abraham, we are told twice, and the two of them walk together, in Genesis 22, verses 6 and 8, followed at the end of the story by the similar phrase, and they walk together, in verse 19. The very same idiom, adjusted slightly to reflect good late official Aramaic, is used twice during Raphael's and Tobiah's journey and once again at its conclusion, the Azlin Trehon Kachada, and the two of them walk together. As Novik rightly observed, not only do the presence of these three phrases signal Tobit's reuse of Genesis 22 as a conceptual template for the journey of Tobiah, but also that their placement mirrors that in Genesis, two occurrences near the beginning of the story and one at its end. This language keys us into some striking, broader parallels between the stories of Isaac and Tobiah. Like Isaac, Tobiah is heading towards what is, by all appearances, certain death, since the demon Asmodeus awaits him in the wedding chamber and has already met a, murdered seven of Sarah's would-be husbands. So this doesn't look good for Tobiah. Um, in both stories, however, a dramatic reversal is effected through the means of an angel, and the protagonistic protagonist is snatched from death at just the very last minute. To be sure, there are also many differences between the two stories, but Tobit's use of the phrase, the two of them walk together, invites attentive hearers to reflect on their similarities. My final passage comes from the same story in Tobit, at the point of Tobiah and Raphael arriving at the home of Sarah's parents, Raguel and Edna. Irene Noel, Matthew Morgan Stern, and a number of other commentators have noticed the near verbatim agreement of an exchange between Jacob and several shepherds from Haran in Genesis 29, and Tobiah's introductory conversation with Edna, Sarah's mother, in Ekbatana. And I've provided the text for you on the screen. You can kind of compare them for yourselves. Morgan Stern, in particular, has shown the remarkable verbal similarity between the Hebrew of Genesis and the Aramaic of 4Q197 in which Edna fills the interrogating role of Jacob, 
and Tobiah and Raphael replace the answering shepherds, Genesis. Once again, the specific phrasing of Tobit calls the astute listener's attention back to Genesis. What is the literary effect of so recognizably citing the ancestral stories of Genesis in creating this new composition during the Hellenistic period? Novick was right to observe that the two episodes from Tobit look more like occasions of slavish copying than literary allusions to or echoes of Genesis. This is more of a literary club to the head than a whisper or a wink to the listening audience. For Novick, the impulse simply to copy the wording of the scriptural source fails to enrich Tobit in any significant way, since it adds nothing substantial to the meaning of Tobiah's story. What it does do, however, is, and here I quote Novick, give expression to the Bible's authority by rendering it an author, end quote. By parroting the biblical text, Tobit, quote, affirms through repetition the primacy of the biblical master plot, end quote. As a result, Novick coined the phrase biblicized narrative to describe what Tobit is up to in these cases, a form of refer referencing earlier scripture that Novick related to the forms of literary allusion, echo, and especially rewritten Bible. The aim of biblicized narrative for Novick is canonical in nature, a reification of the biblical exemplar. There is certainly something fundamentally right about Novick's, Novick's assessment. Translating phrases and larger passages from a text like Genesis in a new composition surely indicates a deep reverence for the source text and seeks to elevate its importance in the act of translation. However, I am less convinced that Tobit is not enriched by this move. Set against the wider backdrop of Jewish Aramaic literature from this period, we have seen that there was special interest in the period of Israel's patriarchs and matriarchs, set alongside that of the exile. As I've already suggested, there is an obvious correspondence between these two periods of Israel's history insofar as both were times of living amidst foreign powers, without political independence. In the Pentateuch, there is a forward gaze to Abraham's descendants inheriting the land promised to him. And in the exile, there is a similar longing for the restoration of that same land. By quoting Genesis, Tobit draws attention to this basic connection. But for a Hellenistic period audience, I submit that it would have done more. By linking Tobiah and Isaac, or Edna and Jacob, the book asserts that the events of Genesis, or once typo typologically analogous to them, were happening once again in the exile. The same forces are at work for Israel's good. The same arc of history is being repeated. This is ultimately a message of hope, as Stephen Weitzman already suggested in his insightful study of Tobit's summative, forward-looking hymn in Tobit chapter 13. I would add just one further caveat to Novick's proposal that Tobit is a biblicized narrative. Some years back, Andrew Perrin and I noted a striking literary equivalence between Tobit and the Genesis Apocryphon that bears a strong formal similarity to the Jacob-Edna parallel, but is not found in biblical Genesis. This is the JBL article that um, Bill was referring to earlier. And I'm going to walk you through this on the slide up here. So um, what we've got are two texts, uh, one in Tobit, one in the Genesis Apocryphon. Uh, which, when we were reading these texts, we discovered used a, a sort of a literary type or a literary frame um, that was almost identical in both texts. So let me show it to you. It has what I would submit are four stages. The first is the event of hearing uh, from someone else. So on the right-hand side, in the Genesis Apocryphon, um, when the king heard the words of Perkinosh, this is one of his senior advisors, and his two companions, They've gone to Abram, they've listened to Abram's wisdom, and specifically they've seen Sarah, well, Abram's wife, while they're there. And they're so bedazzled and amazed by her that they go running back to the king to tell, tell him all about Sarah and how amazing she is. So when the king heard the words, when we go over to Tobit, we have virtually the same phrase with the name simply replaced. And when Tobiah heard the words of Raphael, now this is Raphael, remember the angel, telling Tobiah, the son of Tobit, about the woman, Sarah, he's about to meet. So both are referencing a, a woman, um, and both talk in similar ways about the women, and in fact, both women are named Sarah, which is an interesting thing as well. So they both, they hear this, and then we get a following clause that starts with the Aramaic word D, the relative particle, that, 
Um, that the three of them spoke as one in the Genesis Apocryphon, and in Tobit, that she was his kinswoman and of the house of his father's lineage. And then here was the real clincher for me. We get uh, the resulting desire. So they've heard, and now we get the exact same phrase in Aramaic uh, used for both of these, uh, in both of these situations. He greatly desired her. Same syntax in Aramaic, same words used, same everything. And then we get a subsequent action taken immediately after hearing and desiring, uh, which in the case of the Genesis Apocryphon is that the Pharaoh sent someone to be quick in acquiring her, and in the case of Tobit is that Tobit, uh, Tobiah's heart clung to her all the more. So um, this is what I find at least to be a pretty convincing parallel between these two texts. Uh, the difference in this case, of course, is that we would not uh, be inclined to call the Apocryphon biblical and that we can be less sure of the direction of borrowing in the case of the Genesis Apocryphon than of Genesis. So typologically, this is a very similar case to what we saw uh, between Genesis and Tobit, but now it's not Genesis, it's the Genesis Apocryphon. So what do we make of, of this now? How do we explain that? I doubt that the correspondence between Tobiah and Pharaoh was adduced to affirm the primacy of the Genesis Apocryphon's plot, as Novick argued was the case with uh, when Tobit reused Genesis. And this may uh, signal a need to be factored in with his explanation, that is Novick's explanation, of the borrowings from Genesis. Yet the point that I just made about history being repeated would apply equally to both parallels. The inverse mirroring of Pharaoh's desire for Sarai and Tobias for, for Sarah suggests that events from the days of Abram and Sarai are, in a sense, being repeated in the lives of Tobiah and Sarah. Just as God guided the lives of the distant ancestors, so does he now in the exile. Reflecting on the three main texts discussed in this part of my paper, the Genesis Apocryphon, the Aramaic Levi document, and Tobit, one is struck by their affinities in uh, generic style, thematic interests, and even specific literary units or wording. Yet because the Genesis Apocryphon has typically, typically been classified as rewritten Bible, the Aramaic Levi document is parabiblical literature, or a proto-testament, and Tobit as an early Jewish novella, scholars surveying the landscape of early Jewish literature have tended not to discuss them in connection to one another. I hope to have shown here that these texts and others like them discovered in Quran stand to benefit from such discussion. So in conclusion, now that the Aramaic Dead Sea Scrolls are published and we can survey all of the available evidence, how do they add to our knowledge? This afternoon I have offered two main ways in which they do so. First, the majority of the Aramaic texts from Qumran bear the marks of hang, having emerged from a distinctive school of thought using a characteristic literary approach during the late Persian or Hellenistic periods. The production of this literature evidently faded out of use around the time that the Hasmoneans reclaimed independence in the land of Israel during the second century BCE. Beyond the use of Aramaic as a language of composition, this literary approach included a penchant for first-person narration, recurring themes or topics of interest, repeated use of subgenres like dream visions and wisdom discourses, and distinctive idioms used in similar contexts. Building on this point, the Qumran discoveries allow us to see something that we couldn't see before. Texts like First Enoch, Tobit, and the Aramaic chapters of Daniel, all of which we knew before the scrolls were found, were not unrelated as they had typically been treated in the past. They grew from the same soil, as individual products of a broader literary effort, sustained by a shared school of thought. If this point is accepted, then in addition to studying individual texts among the Aramaic scrolls, we may begin to explore a literary movement on analogy with the so-called Deuteronomistic school responsible for Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomistic history of Jeremiah, or the distinctive circles behind the Hebrew sectarian texts from Qumran. Second, the Aramaic texts show over and over again that they were written to address the challenges faced by Israel while living under the rule of non-Israelites, and in the midst of what one of our texts called those who are foreign and mixed. This is the testament of Kahath. This was done by writing what today we would call historical fiction, focused on figures from Israel's past. In many cases, these were characters drawn from what we now call the Pentateuch, either augmenting the stories of central figures like Noah and Jacob, or creating stories that depended on very meager biblical source material for the likes of Enoch, Levi, Kahat, and Amram. 
Stories of exilic figures like Tobit and Daniel also drew heavily from earlier writings, as we saw in the case of Tobit. What ties these texts together is their focus on times when Israel or their ancestors had to navigate situations that bore a basic formal resemblance to the, to the Hellenistic period. Situations involving foreigners in a prevailing culture that the authors of these texts considered to be corrupt and at odds with ancestral practices. The problems and situations faced by Noah, Abram, Amrat, Amram, Tobit, and Daniel overlapped in important ways with the problems faced by the audiences of the Aramaic literature. More to the point, they were made to overlap, marshalling, readapting, and depending heavily upon their ancestral Hebrew writings, our authors created a new literature for a new time in Israel's history that wrestled with challenges that turned out to be very old indeed. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I have thoughts, but nothing very sure. I mean, the, the question is, what did they think they were doing? And I think, or at least for me, that's that's one of the questions. And uh, another question would be, uh, are, were they trying to sort of pull the wool over people's eyes and, and purport that these actually were the writings that were preserved from Noah and Enoch and others, uh, Levi and so forth? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's possible that they were trying to um, sort of convince people that, that these were true, accurate historical documents that went back to these figures in, in history. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be too committed to that view. I think it, to my mind, it could simply be that these were um, beloved and ancestral stories and that people who read them would have known that these were interpretations of those stories but that they were interpretations that taught important lessons for how they were to navigate the, the world that they were in at that time. And so I think that um, uh, I don't have a firm answer for it. I mean, it is a question that I have about what, what was the intention behind this first-person narrative. Another thing is that it simply could be a literary device that was used at the time. Uh, you know, I think uh, that's why I gave those examples from the Ahikar narrative and uh, Darius's inscription. Um, this was the cool thing to do in Aramaic literature, presumably at that time, was to write first-person narratives of historical figures. So it, it, I also wonder if there might have been some sort of um, prestige involved in this. Like, look, look, we can also write literature just as good as, or even better than, um, those who are part of the Persian administration can do. And I think actually that they did write uh, literature that was just as good or better. So that might also be a factor. Yeah. So maybe following that thought, how do you imagine the authors who had a political or polemic uh, reason for their writing, how would that be disseminated yeah. to the people at a time of minimal literacy? Yeah. Oral tradition? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I think it, it clearly was written by kind of the intelligentsia of the time. This is very really impressively written Aramaic. They know what they were doing. There are international sources that they're incorporating into this literature. Um, my guess is that it would have been, um, and this is only a guess, it would have been distributed through sort of networks. I think this is priestly literature. There's a lot in here about priests and Le Levitical priesthood, as I mentioned. So I feel like it was written by priests. That would be my best guess. And in, in the priestly capacity during the Second Temple period as Israel's teachers, I think it would have been promulgated through those networks. Um, that's just a guess at this point. I need to do more research on that point. But my guess is also that people wouldn't be reading it firsthand, but that this might have been something that was read in communities, um, you, know, you know, entertaining stories. And there's actually quite a bit of humor in these texts as well. So there would have been certainly points at which people would have broken out laughing, I think, and, and things like that. So, yeah. That's just a guess, though, right now. Are there any other hands? Yeah. So, uh, so these are like stories, like stories like we have today, an author writing a story mm -hmm. and, and putting dialogue to the people. And in those times, it was for transmitting halakha and yeah. information. So from generation to generation, 
Yeah. They can transmit this information yeah. to hold the, the, the group together. Exactly. Yeah, I think this was basically um, sort of a literary conduit for priestly teaching, in my opinion. So there was a lot of halakha, but there were also all sorts of other ancestral practices like marriage, the one that I brought up. These texts, it's all over in these texts, uh, they're worried about marriage. And so they're showing that all of these ancestral figures were paying very close attention to how they married. You know? So I think in rewriting or writing new texts, um, they chose themes and topics that for them were important for helping people to, to navigate and to live in that particular situation. But using the ancestral texts, yeah. doing so. Yeah? Why would they want to have the same sacrificial I was very surprised by Noah's sacrifice of the Jewish way of accepting it. Yeah. Why would they be that specific to the Jewish tradition yeah. after the Sinai? Yeah. Why would they want that to be an archive when that had nothing, Noah was not a Jew? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. I mean, I think there's, a, there's sort of an accompanying situation in these texts, which uh, some people have written about, which is, where is Moses in, in all of these texts? You know, it doesn't seem like there's very much of an interest in Moses or Sinai or, or any of that. Much more interest in um, sort of the pre-Sinai period with all of these patriarchs and matriarchs like Abraham and Noah and so forth and so on. Um, I, I don't know that I have a ready answer for that particular question other than they, they were portraying this as um, Moses simply receiving something that was, I, I think Enoch is a very important figure in this um, literature. Because we've got this, this, um, you know, these few words about him in Genesis five, which are very enigmatic. About he, he walked with God and he was no more. And those genealogies where everybody else dies. So what's going on? And he also lived 365 years where everybody else is living, you know, 800, 900 years. So something's happening there with Enoch. And what is it? And people are very interested in what's going on with Enoch. And so Enoch, at least in this literature, became um, this really important, exalted figure. And he's got a direct link connection with God, um, really much like Moses does, you know, and later in the tradition. So I think there's there's an emphasis on Enoch, and Enoch kind of becomes the starting point in this this tradition at this time for some reason. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the very beginning of your talk, you uh, you identified uh, several of the Aramaic scrolls that were distributed among the different caves. Yeah. And so uh, is, is it clear to you that the, that the that first number before the Q yeah. uh, is, is really just an identifier, should just be regarded as an identifier rather than an interpretive right. hint? Because you know, it could be like how I organize my files. Right. In which case, forget about yeah. Right. Is there any rhyme or reason, basically, exactly. to which caves these things are in? That's an interesting question. I mean, people have written uh, some on the, the profiles of the caves and what each cave has in it, and whether there's anything going on in those caves. I, I don't know that. Um, certainly, some caves do have different profiles. Uh, for example, Cave Seven is only Greek texts, so that's interesting. So there's something going on there. Um, I think the main point that I take away from the caves is simply that the Aramaic texts were distributed pretty evenly across the caves. So it doesn't seem like there's any one cave in particular where they, like with the Greek texts, for instance, where they're all in cave seven, they're kind of mingled in with the Hebrew texts all, all over the place. And um, I mean, I didn't really talk about the connection to the Hebrew sectarian literature at, at Qumran among the scrolls, but these Aramaic texts, I think, were older and preceded this group who gathered all these texts together at Qumran. So I think that they, they somehow came into possession of these texts and just had them distributed throughout throughout the caves alongside of the, uh, the other scrolls. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if that's all the questions, I thank you so much. And thank you.